Hi MS Translators and welcome to our day three summary coming to you live from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, Ekrams 2022 has officially wrapped. Uh, we have made it through. It has been quite a tiring conference. It's fair to say that uh, we're feeling a little bit drained, a lot of long days to get to this point, uh, but we did want to come on quickly uh, and just give you some, some short thoughts about what happened on day three to complement the summaries that you've already seen for days one and day two. Primarily for this summary, you're going to be hearing from Dr. Stiles next to me uh, because I spent a lot of today recording future podcast episodes with Ekrams. So the day three podcast, as with day one and day two, will be available uh, online through all major podcasting platforms, so Spotify and Apple, as well as a number of others. So we do encourage you to make sure you download that podcast and have a listen. My guest on today's podcast uh, was Martin Torre, uh, who's a famous neurologist from uh, Barcelona, but is also the new president of Ectrums, and she gave a really interesting insights into her highlights across the three days of the conference. We also recorded some other podcast episodes that are going to form part of the Ekrams 365 experience. That is basically that you're going to be hearing communications from Ekrams all the way throughout the year, not just at conference time. And we uh, did some interesting podcast episodes, one on a remyelination trial uh, and one on AHSCT. So both topics that we know are of interest to you, they'll be coming out in the subsequent weeks post the conference and we'll make sure that we promote them for you when that happens. So because I was recording those podcast episodes, obviously I wasn't sitting in sessions as much today. You, however, did, and I would say that some of the stuff that you saw today was probably some of the stuff that you found the most interesting across the three days. Do you want to fill us in on what you heard about today? Sure. I was a little bummed because the there was a session on HSCT that actually was at the same time as the lipid section, um, and I actually came really close to going to that one, and I'm glad I didn't because uh, I went. There was a session that was dedicated to the role of lipids in MS pathology, and uh, Dr. Sayre and uh, the, who's the th uh, other one that you, Dr. Hafler? Yeah. So uh, were two people that I was uh, familiar with. Uh, but I was really excited about a talk. Uh, it ended up being my favorite talk of the conference. Um, by and I and I really I, I hope I get his first name right. But I, I believe it was uh, uh, Jerome um, Hendricks. And I keep I keep getting I keep wanting to call him Jeremy. So I hope, hopefully Jerome is right. Um, and he talked about you know like we the, one of the themes throughout the meeting was uh, this kind of recurring theme of you know at, after an MS attack you have kind of like this myelin debris burden and then you get uh, you know cells will come in largely microglia macrophages and they'll engulf all this but then it becomes overwhelming and they become what's called foam cells which is basically uh, they just get clogged up with the, all the lipid junk that they're eating and then one of the consequences of that is besides there's a lot of inflammation that happens as a result of that it was interesting because uh, I, I know that foam cells are inflammatory but it's interesting because they talked about the timing of it originally when those cells come in there and they start eating the myelin debris, they're actually anti-inflammatory. Yeah. And then they pivot to being pro-inflammatory. Um, and one of the things that happens that's a, not an inflammatory event, but that it, but it's detrimental, is cholesterol efflux gets shut down, which is crazy because basically the stuff that they're eating can easily be released as cholesterol. So cholesterol efflux is... Cholesterol efflux is like, you know, so they're taking up all these lipids and then eventually like the surrounding tissue, especially the neurons need cholesterol to can maintain their membrane integrity. And so these cells would normally spit cholesterol back out after they've either if they synthesize it or if they're chewing up these lipids and they can repackage as cholesterols, they'd spit it back out so the neurons could take it up and that gets impaired. Even though there's all of this by this product that's ready and kind of perfectly suitable to make the cholesterol, it just, the cells just shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the main reasons that happens is there's this cholesterol tr uh, efflux transporter, ABCA, ABCA1, ABC1, man, I'm just getting a long day. Uh, and with it, I heard we, that was a kind of a recurring theme as they talked about, you know, lipid, in lipid engulfment, foam cell formation, cholesterol efflux shutdown, and the, and the cholesterol transporter. And, you know, one of the things for me, I'm a little biased about why I was so interested in this, because one of the things for me is we work on lipoprotein receptors, which engulf a lot of these lipids. And 
uh, we've shown that there's a beneficial effect in blocking these receptors, but one of the things we've always known can be potentially problematic is that you also can uh, block some of that myelin uptake. Mm -hmm. And it's been kind of a paradox because, you know, uh, Dr. Hendricks talked about, you know, the two things you want to do is you want to improve cholesterol efflux and also improve the myelin uptake and clearance. Where the where it bottlenecks is you take up too much myelin and you jam the gears and everything kind of shuts down. Mm -hmm. And obviously that makes sense. If you can be more efficient with the way that you can clear that myelin debris, chew it up so you can spit out more cholesterol, that makes sense. But we've seen that you can actually block some of that uptake and engulf engulfment and uh, get uh, and still have beneficial effects. And it's been a bit paradoxical. And one of the things that Dr. Hendricks showed in is that you know if you if you can sh stop short of that foam cell formation, and to the to the extent of like even if you can just restrict the the cholesterol uptake, you can actually maintain the cholesterol efflux. And to me, I was like, that's a really interesting pathway. And he talked about a couple genes. He talked about uh, UBE3A uh, and PLIN2. UBE3A. Uh, UBE3A is actually this uh, one of the, the enzymes that actually degrades the cholesterol the cholesterol efflux. So it, you know this when this UB, UBE3A goes up, it chews up all of the cholesterol efflux receptor, so no more cholesterol can get out. Um, but if you block, if you or at least slow down that that myelin uptake, uh, even though you're you know that's maybe detrimental for the myelin debris, you actually maintain the cholesterol efflux. And I thought that was super interesting because okay. it's a potential mechanism that that could that could uh, um, explain why we can see a benefit, or at least contribute to the benefit. And in conversations I was having later. Uh, I was talking to some other faculty. I, I don't want to, to talk about their data without their permission, but they'd seen similar things. That was they, similarly paradoxical, where you know slowing down or blocking other receptors that are known to be involved in this process actually led to a little bit more beneficial phenotype. And to, I vote. And to me, I, the, the question becomes: like, do we really know that if we're able to block the detrimental effects of the myelin debris? Is it really that bad if we slow down the clearance? Because it mm. kind of looks like we, it might be not that big of a deal. Is it's is because we if we can kind of pace the cells to chew up this mess at a little bit more reasonable pace instead of gumming up the gears and trying to take on too much, it looks like you might actually be able to get a much more realistic kind of benefit out of that and not have these foam cells form. Which you know, one of the other bad things about these foam cells is it it takes them a really long time to go back to normal, if at all, or a lot of times they die. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then what good are they, right? Yep. So if you can kind of tip the scale so that they don't go to the foamy state and they can just chew up chew up fat and spit it back out as cholesterol, uh, you know, that it, you, you maybe that could, it, and again, this is not what Dr. Hendricks was saying. This is kind of like kind of what my takeaway message was. But it was the first time I'd ever heard somebody talk about the mechanisms in a way where I was like, oh man, this might be why these observations that are floating around in the ether might make sense. Mm. Um, and to that, to that end, I, that's why I thought it was one of the best talks because it gave me, it sparked new ideas. It was yeah. really innovative in terms of like, not people aren't thinking about it this way. You know what I mean? Like it's like the, 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 the his 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 presentation wasn't canonical. It wasn't like he was just reiterating or summarizing a whole bunch of known stuff. He was basically putting pieces together in a puzzle, you know, in a larger puzzle that we've all kind of seen, but he was putting key pieces together that we hadn't seen yet, and it was really cool. Yeah. It sounds almost like then, is it fair to say, and this is this is 100% your area, so tell me if I've got this wrong, but we've got factors here that are preventing myelin repair. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like what you're thinking <coughs> here is that we have a seesaw Mm -hmm. And we have things, if we're on either end of that seesaw, we've got problems. Mm -hmm. If we've got too much myelin debris building up, seesaws go on too much one way, problem, we don't get myelin repair. We're chewing up all of the myelin debris, then we start to lose the cholesterol efflux. We've also got a problem, seesaws going the other way. And what you think we need to have is some sort of balance there so that we've got, is that? I think, I think that's one way to look at it and I definitely think that's possible. But I think what even goes beyond that is what I think has not been said openly or at least tested because everybody assumes that we have to get rid of the myelin debris. It's an existential issue that we can't allow to persist. I'm wondering if we can just snap the seesaw in half and just you know, maybe not worry about the myelin debris and just maintain the cholesterol efflux. And if that would be enough to maintain the neuronal integrity, like, you know, these, it's almost like if you, is the myelin a problem? 
if you block the detrimental effects, right? Like if you can just push it off to the side for a little bit, let everybody get their job going and deal with it as, 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 you know, as they start to free up the ability to do so, as opposed to rushing to do all of that all at once before getting to the other stuff, maybe that's the, in, in that, to your point, that's, that becomes the seesaw, but you know, the, a lot of the, the work I was discussing with other faculty members and the work we've done, we're not trying to be measured. Mm. We're blocking stuff like, mm. like binary. Um, now there's multiple redundant mechanisms from myelin uptake. So it is a bit of an attenuation. Not, it's not, it's not black and white, but you, you know, it, it canonically, because I, I think fundamentally what I came away with that thinking is it seems apparent like even if what I'm saying is is wrong or or I'm overextending the interpretation I think we've been oversimplifying and saying oh this is an existential issue we need to focus on this and anything that slows that down is bad yep I'm just gonna say here that I think there has been no <laughs> greater example across not just the three days that we've been doing this here but any videos that we've done of the the differences between us where I want a seesaw and trying to find balance and you've decided that you just want to snap that seesaw in <laughs> half. I think that's a perfect example of the two of us. I, I mean, I, yeah, because I took your analogy and I said, no, we, it's great analogy. Let's snap it. Let's snap it in Let's half. Let's just snap that board. Snap it in half. <laughs> was there anything else that was that your main thing from today? I, I, I was very excited about that talk. Um, the the other two lipid talks were, were actually really interesting. Um, the uh the, the 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 second one it's not Sarah but Sarah but the uh David Hefler Professor Hefler no so it was Sarah so it was because uh I I actually thought she was very smart and you know she went into a lot of the uh, the the same type of mechanisms but she she did it on more of a bit of a macro side she wasn't looking at this much of the like deep pathway analysis mm -hmm. um uh, I really appreciated her her stuff. I, it, she had a, it, she gave a, a really good synopsis. A lot of things answered a lot of good questions. But I got to tell you, like I I just the the whole time I was listening to her talk, I was still going through and I was like looking for papers and I was searching for for stuff from the Hendricks talk because um, I really think the the data he presented, even though he didn't put it together in the way that I'm thinking about it, it was pieces of a puzzle where to me it was the first time I started being able to see a rational story. Well, that's really right? the, I mean, that's the point of these conferences. It's to yep. put stuff out there to allow us to start thinking. Yep. to get us to give something you know we hear something new and then we go away and go i'm going to try and build on that yeah I'm going to yeah try and work out what's next and i will say as a summer as a kind of a, a, a since we're wrapping up the conference i will say that was one of the themes i got from this conference is you know we haven't been here for three years right. I mean, covid shut it down there was virtual but this is our first time back in person and in many of the big talks where it was big lecture halls and everybody there I didn't feel like there was a ton of difference between what we were hearing now versus before. Mm. But in the smaller rooms where it was grad students and postdocs and early stage faculty, and I, you know, I don't, I don't mean to put, you know, Dr. Hendricks in that box, but I think that there's, I, because I was aware of the other two presenters and not necessarily him, I do think he was at least maybe a little bit more junior. Um, that was where the real gold was. Mm. And, and so, um, I actually hope that, you know, going forward, look, I, you and I have discussed this a couple of times. Um, the pandemic really threw a wrench in things. Science just didn't yes. move as quick. Yeah. Um, and so to expect the same advancements that we've been used to for the previous decade, probably, you know, pro we're probably catching up now. Um, and so probably next year we can be looking, we can be expecting very similar advancements. Um, but this year, it, it definitely felt like it was a little bit less innovative. And, and I would love to see more of those outside the box, different ideas, uh, uh, younger minds presenting their stuff. Like, because I got, I tell you, I, I really got a lot out of those, those talks. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, um, similarly, there were some things where, you know, it wasn't necessarily the, the big advancement. But I think the, the positive for me was around... Um, the overall themes of the conference and mm -hmm. the fact that there is now uh, <clears throat> and this isn't the first time I think this is there has been some of these but this indicates a commitment rather than a, a once-off that there are specific topics that we're going to make sure that even if there's not necessarily anything new we're going to come together and talk about them yep we're going to talk about symptomatic management of multiple sclerosis mm -hmm. I talked about that in our day two video 
Um, and you know there wasn't much new but we need to get together because we know that that's something that's important for for people living with multiple sclerosis so we're yeah. going to have a commitment to talk about those things similarly progressive ms you know progress in that field is never as quick as, as anyone wants it to be yep but we're going to keep talking about it at this meeting because it's important that everyone's there to try and at least there hasn't been a lot of progress let's talk about how we can make those steps forward so i think it's in terms of coming out of it i think the fact that we're both sitting here even though we're exhausted but there is i would say already genuine excitement for what are we going to see in milan yep. in 12 months i think that's a really positive sign I, I agree i i would i would just say like if if, if the extremes people were to come to me and ask me for my opinion which they never would nor should they um, I would say what everything you just said I think is very valuable and I really like the intent behind it but I would say it was a lot of time dedicated to those themes like a lot of times it was multiple sessions over all three days yep. and if you're gonna do that I would say there should be a little bit more of a concerted effort to find less consensus well and I, what I would say though with that is I, I, I agree but it's also hard to know exactly what's being said in every session because we just can't be there. No, that's true. That is true. Um, and so you never know what's happening in all of these different sessions between the two of us. At best, we're going to two out of nine in every block. Um, yeah. But and yeah, we were I mean, we were very lucky. Alban volunteered to go to a couple for true. us. True. Uh, there was a couple. I mean, when we were sitting around talking with Alban, just having dinner, uh, we were like, "Man, I really wish we could go to these." And he was just like, "I'll go." Yeah. Very I'll nice of him. So, anyway, that wraps our day three um, summary. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed our coverage. Do stay tuned because there will be more stuff coming out, including a video of Travis discussing with uh, another one of our special guests at the conference, Olban, about some really interesting work um, that was presented at the conference. Stay tuned for different podcasts that are coming out that we'll be promoting. For now, I think the two of us both need to get some sleep, which we were told at the conference is really important for good health. Yes, it so is. So we'll be trying to catch up on some of that. Thank you very much for listening. As always, if you do have questions, make sure that you post them underneath the video uh, and we will uh, respond to them as quickly as possible. But thank you very much and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye-bye. See ya.